methane, which is a nice, nice methane of the road, new road fee year. So first of all, we welcome all the guests from overseas. We'll have a welcome at the end. But uh, for now, I would like to ask the Honorary Secretary to address us, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming and uh, joining our meeting. Um, before we start, let's hear the housekeeping rules. Over to you, Vinit. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, so good evening, everyone, and welcome. So I guess the rules are now quite familiar even to the new people. But uh, please do make sure you take a second to mute yourself if you're not already on mute. Uh, please do keep your video on at all times so all of us can put a face to your name. Uh, and do make sure that you're logged in with your correct name that you'd like to be addressed by and you're not called Oppo something. Uh, we do have uh, live transcripts enabled on this, uh, for this uh, session. So you have an option of clicking on live transcripts and getting to uh, see a translation of what's, uh, what's being discussed. Uh, and of course, as you have already noticed, the disc this session is being recorded. Uh, and by continuing to attend, you are giving your permission uh, for the recording and for it to be used in social media as, as we may see fit. Uh, with that, a warm welcome to all of you again and back to you, President Lewis. Thank you, uh, Sergeant Alvinit. Okay, for now, I'm going to just share screens. Next, we would like to ask, okay, for the Toastmaster. Hi, President Lewis. Yes, hello. I, it is my pleasure to raise the toast to the Rotary Club of Thames, which is in the in Nepal. So I'd like to raise the toast yeah. to the Rotary Club of Thames, Nepal. Rotary Club of Thames. And oh. Rotary Club of Thames. And Rotary <laughs> International. And Rotary, and Rotary, and Rotary International. International. Rotary International. <laughs> Rotary International. Thank you, Rotary and PK Walia. Thank you. And now we will make some announcements. We have two birthday boys, Abdul Merchant and Ingo Kletschmidt on the 6th and 7th September. We wish them the best of health and the best of 2021. Happy birthday. And then we have anniversary. Oh, okay. So this week there's no wedding anniversary. But this evening, we would have the induction of uh, new members, Mohandas, Vishindas, Trugani, and Hitansh Vik. May I call upon membership director Subash to address us, please. Hello, hi, good evening um, to everyone. Thank you, President Lewis, for introducing the new members. Uh, uh, I must, uh, I'll start with uh, Mohan Chogani. Um, Mohan has been, uh, been my very good friend and cycling buddy. I think we must have done about 3,000 kilometers of cycling in the last one year or so. so. He's a great guy. He's in software industry. And, uh, and he is an avid animal lover strong vegetarian, a lot of love for the life, protects the life. And I'm sure, I'm sure his uh, joining the club will bring the little new flavor and new direction and new 
new it will open the new vistas for club to harness his passion and involve in the social activities that's for mohan and he would because we have a lot of respectable members with no first name mohan so he decided to be called as shugani uh, in the in the group and incidentally i should mention he is related to 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 our honorable uh, bhagwan das also so he is so it, it really can lineage continues in the club so this is what i will say only for mohan and uh, i think we will welcome him collectively once i finish with the other uh, new member and the new member is hitansh um, uh, hitansh is from chandigarh he has been very active in rotrek club for long long time and he he held a lot of senior positions and his mother has been also very active in rotrek club chandigarh so there comes a continuation of service to the uh, to the community so he is one of the great um, assets will be for the club and <coughs> i just before i i i introduce him i i came to know that he has traveled in more than 39 countries he is a is a foot loose if you call it you know and he has targeted to <coughs> exceed 50 countries he is married is a wife tulika and his daughter uh, yashashika about um, uh, two years two years plus He's been living in singapore for 6 7 years and works for oracle and i'm sure in his again it happens to be a very good squash player and avid cyclist so i'm looking forward for another person adds to our cyclist group so i will um, welcome both of them to the club and request uh, president lois to uh, do the honors uh, after this talk thank you thank you membership director subhash thank you. now just give me a moment while i will share screen again Oh, David. Apologies. Just give me a minute. Uh, actually, in in the meantime, we can ask the new Rotarians to introduce themselves. Yes. Uh, let's do that. Can we ask uh, Mohandas to address us, followed by Hitansh, please? Sure. Yeah. Um. Thank you. Uh. President Lewis, and uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Subhash. Uh, as Subhash mentioned, uh, you know most people uh, they call me by my name Mohan, but in in but here in the Rotary Club there are already two honourable members who are also known as Mohan. So as to avoid confusion, you know you all you all can call me by my surname Chugani instead. So about myself. I'm married to Kavita Melwani, and we have two grown-up kids. Both I and Kavita run an IT company, Natreach Asia, which is mainly involved in the development and support of new software applications. Uh, much credit goes to my very good uh, friend Subhash Preetmani for explaining to me the work of Rotary. Rotary. 
Rotary fits in with my ideals of giving back to society, considering the opportunities and benefits I was given living and working in Singapore. My spiritual mentor, Dada J.P. Waswani, has been my biggest source of inspiration, who has said to, who has said to be happy, you must make others happy, and what you give others eventually comes back to you. So I'm at the stage of my life where I'm finding some time I can devote giving back to society, the causes, and the causes which interest me, are environment, sustainability, animal rights, alternative meats, and children education. And I hope to contribute in these areas. So I'd like to thank Honorable President Lewis and the Board of Rotary for accepting my membership, P.P. Mohandas for meeting up with me and answering my doubts. And last but not least, to my good friend Subhash for introducing me to the Rotar Rotarian world. I look forward to contributing to Rotary in my small capacity in whatever measure I can to raise the quality of life of the disadvantaged. Thank you. Thank you, Mohandas. Welcome. And now Hitanish, please address us. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, uh, President Lewis. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, you know, for having me here, for uh, getting my uh, membership approvals, everything in order. Uh, really appreciate everything. Uh, quick introduction perspective. Uh, I've been in Singapore for about, roughly about touching seven years now. Uh, very closely associated with Rotary from a fairly long time. I remember I started um, in my school uh, during, you know, uh, the Interact Club days, then graduated to Rotaract as a Rotaractor. I was uh, the director international in the club at that time uh, from my graduation days in yeah, early 2000s, mid 2000s. And uh, then I actually lost light touch with Rotary uh, for a few time when I moved out of house to study. Uh, but it has always been in the family. My mother's been an ardent rota uh, Rotarian. She's been the past president of her club. Uh, I actually come from the home club of uh, PRIP, uh, Mr. R.K. Sabu, uh, very close. So we've, we've had many, many sessions together on how Rotary makes a difference and what are the things we should be doing. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this because uh, it actually, you know, especially in Singapore, it's a great avenue to see and do what we can do because being a super developed country uh, we also have to you know the the ideas that come out i was i was talking to uh, uh, you know other fellow members a few days ago on what is the kind of work we are doing what are the avenues we can touch in uh, so really looking forward uh, to do uh, more and more in the area of, about healthcare on making sure if we can contribute more towards education and also shaping a uh, kids in a school college environment towards the realities of corporate life. So that's also something uh, I really wish to uh, work towards on that. Uh, once again, uh, thank you so much everyone for having me here. Um, thank you, uh, my, my, my regards to uh, uh, you know, uh, Rotarian uh, Suresh, um, Subhash, Vineet, uh, and a few more people who've really helped me through in, in this uh, Rotary Club Singapore's orientation journey and uh, are looking forward to work more together and catching up soon in person. Thank you. Thank you, Itanj, and a warm welcome to you as well. Thank you, President. And now I proceed to induct the two of you. Induction of new members, Mr. Mohan, Mohandas Vishindas Shugani and Mr. Hitanj Rich. Fellow Rotarians, it is my privilege and pleasure today to welcome into our membership, Mohandas Vishindas Shugani and Hitanj Rich, who are proposed for membership by Rotarian Subhash Pritmani and Rotarian Binit Iyanga. The proposals have been reviewed in accordance with the constitution and bylaws of our club. Chugani and Hitanj, as you would like to be known in the club, we now proceed to admit you into membership in our club, the Rotary Club of Singapore. You have been chosen for membership in this club because your fellow members believe in you to be a leader in your field and have qualities which will allow you to carry out the work of a Rotarian. In electing you to membership, we are doing more than taking you into our fellowship. We are making you a trustee, 
with us or Rotary's ideals. Knowing you to be a Rotarian, the world will henceforth judge Rotary by your conduct. Membership in Rotary is an honor and privilege, and every privilege has its corresponding obligations. You have agreed to accept the responsibilities attached to your membership in this club and to obey this club's constitution and bylaws. One of the special obligations of membership is regular attendance at the weekly meetings and the monthly service committee meetings and participation in club projects and activities. It is the primary method of fulfilling the principles of service and fellowship and also a way by which you represent your vocations. To Ghani and Hitanj, the ideal of Rotary is service. The, our principal motto is service above self and the object of this club and all Rotary clubs worldwide is to encourage and foster this ideal as a basis of worthy enterprise. You are to share in this effort. For the rest of this Rotary year, I would be pleased if you would serve on the following committees. For Chugani, community service, your mentor would be past president, Baliyah Mohandas, who shares your name. Hitanj, you will be in vocational service and your mentor is past president, Tapan Rao. Your mentors will guide your assimilation through the service committee. And your classifications are as follows. For Chugani, you will be information technology software. For Hitanj, you will be IT services and sales. As you represent a classification, it is your duty to tell us about your vocations and to bring the ideals of Rotary using your business and professions. And now, by the power vested in me as president of the Rotary Club of Singapore, I declare you to be an active member of this Rotary Club. I will present you with a Rotary emblem and a packet of Rotary literature at a later date when I get to see you. I especially commend to your attention the object of Rotary and the four-way test which form the criteria for Rotarians in their daily lives. I also suggest that as and when you travel, you avail yourself of the extraordinary opportunity you will have to attend Rotary meetings and meet Rotarians throughout the world. This is another very rewarding benefit of your membership. And now I call upon all fellow Rotarians, guests, and friends. To pre I present to you Rotarians Sugani and Hitanj, our newest members. Please unmute yourself to welcome them. Welcome. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so Once again, thank you. And thank you, Mrs. Chugani, for attending. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. So we move to the next segment now. We have a very important matter to, to actually uh, address the club. And we are so proud of this. And I would like to ask that uh, all of us take note of these uh, citations. This is a great uh, reward for the hard work put in by IPP Dinesh and his board of last year. And I believe all Rotarians in our club have put in effort. This is the Rotary Citations for Rotary Year 2020 to 2021 award. And I read from immediate past district governor Raja Mohan Munisami, his message to us. Congratulations, your club in our district has earned the Rotary Citations, the most significant award a Rotary club can achieve for 2020-2021. During a year that was challenging for many Rotarians around the world, your club demonstrates a commitment to achieve your goals, which ultimately helps strengthen Rotary and shape our future. 
once again, can we all unmute and give a round of applause for this magnificent award? Congratulations. 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 IPP. Can I just ask IPP to give us a short uh, share? Maybe one minute. Thank you. Thank you, President Lewis. And I think I have to I have to thank all the members, especially my board, uh, for the all the work done last year. I think we were able to make a little difference. Uh, it was, uh, people call me a virtual president. It started uh, virtually and ended virtually, and I hope you will learn. Uh, just, I think, uh, I thank everyone uh, once again, and especially all the members for your support. And uh, yes, we, we were able to achieve what we uh, planned. And I think uh, it's up to, we had a great uh, Rotary. Uh, thank you so much. And thank you, President Lewis. Thank you. Thank you, IPP Dinesh. Congratulations once again to you and your board and to all Rotarians in our club and Rotarians from other clubs. It is a collective effort that we can achieve this. Thank you very much. All right, so. And now we have a report for Bhakti Luhur, which is the orphanage COVID-19 project Indonesia. Uh, this is more for information, but this was an important project for us. This is the project that we did and uh, it has helped many. And we have 113 approved global grants. Congratulations to us. And we have a big thank you to uh, DFRC PP, Dr. Shahul. Dr. Shahul, are you in the meeting tonight? Yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Would thank you me. like to share about one minute about what's happening? Right. Uh, this is the uh, global grant for Indonesia for our... Yeah. Yeah the Global Grant for Indonesia for the supply of oxygen cylinders for their COVID-19 uh, response. And our club raised a total of 25,000 US dollars. Uh, special thanks to uh, Tolaram Foundation. I think uh, Chairman uh, Pak Mohan Vaswani is here. So thank you, Pak Mohan, for matching the contribution of 25,000 with another 25,000. So total is $50,000. Thank you. Thank you, PP Dr. Shahul. Thank you to Pamohan. And now we move to our next segment. May I call upon our Environment and Sustainability Director, Louisa Lee, to address us, please. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, PP Louis and um, P. Louis. <laughs> All soon, our soon. peace and and um, and esteem Rotarians. So I am very excited um, um, that we have with us tonight um, a speaker who is going to actually be kickstarting our series of conversations um, about change makers who are in the space of environment. So uh, just a little bit before I introduce Bjorn. Uh, above me, you see uh, some logos. I would just like to um, very quickly introduce everyone to ESRUG. So ESRUG stands for Environmental Sustainability Rotary Action Group. And um, I'm a member currently of the Southeast Asia Group. And it was formed to empower members of the Rotary family worldwide to take actions against uh, to sustain our environment, uh, particularly to stabilize our climate. So everyone is welcome uh, to be a member. But of course, if you join our Rotary, our own Singapore Rotary Club of Singapore Sustainability uh, and Environment Group, uh, you actually do get updates uh, from me too. So as everyone knows, environment is Rotary's seventh new area of focus. And our esteemed speaker tonight is Bjorn Lo, who founded Edible Garden City 
in 2012 with the hopes of building urban farms to help Singapore tackle its food security challenge. Today, Edible Garden City employs a team of 40 staff members and it's carving out its own niche in a new industry sector in Singapore and has built more than 260 food gardens for hotels, schools, F&B outlets, property developers and home gardens here. With a strong belief in educational initiatives to the public and to youths, Beyond has actually actively given close to 1,000 public talks and given workshops to industry professional students in, in many, many different countries around the world. Um, in a span of nine years, Edible Garden City has contributed to the growing discussions of urban farming and food security, and that will be our topic for today. So the format will be that Beyond would share on the emergence of a new agriculture paradigm. And then after that, we will be engaging in a fireside chat. Uh, thereupon, we will also invite members, uh, Rotarians, to pose any questions that you may have. So without much further ado, um, I introduce to you Bjorn Lo. Good evening, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you again for this warm uh, invitation and introduction. Uh, and thank you, uh, President Lewis Lim and uh, all past president. I was at the inauguration and I was uh, uh, in awe of the, um, the community spirit uh, within the road tree. Uh, and that, that is, uh, of course, something to uh, we hope to emulate in, in, in the work that we do. Um, so I'll share a quick presentation with, with everyone. Um, I do have a lot of slides, so if you do um, um, sort of um, indulge me a little bit on, uh, on, on, the, on the topic. Um, okay. Oh, sorry. Um, just give me a second. Um, Okay, can everyone see the slides proper um, without my notes? Um, so, um, so I, I, I started uh, not, not from agriculture background. Uh, I spent about 10, 10 to 15, uh, 10 years in, in corporate, uh, in digital marketing, actually in Singapore and London. And that's when I kind of uh, decided to leave uh, to search for a more sustainable life. And you can see me here in the middle of Wales, uh, tending to a vegetable bit. Uh, but my, my real intention was really to seek for a more sustainable lifestyle. I lived in a year for a year in Wales uh, where I had no electricity uh, and a pet sheep um, uh, lamb running around in my, in my, in my year, you know, uh, almost every day just shitting around, uh, not, not very hygienic. But, uh, you know, it gave, gave me sort of an insight into what a self-sustainable life live very romantic in, in many sense, you know, the English countryside can, can, can invoke in one person. Um, but that brought me back to Singapore, right, um, after my experiences overseas uh, and to look at uh, the challenges that we face as a small nation, um, uh, as a high consumption nation. Um, but, but then looking back into the history of Singapore, in the past, we, we actually were quite self-sustainable in food production. Uh, with a much smaller population, with 20,000 farms, 25% of our land, uh, we were actually producing excess of food and exporting some of them. But of course, with, with every um, country with, with um, ch uh, changes happening, uh, farms were then um, relegated from, um, from major urban planning. Uh, all the pig farms were phased out. Today, we produce 1%. 1% of our land is dedicated to agriculture. Uh, and we actually import 90% of our food from 170 countries. Now, this is, um, again, um, this is one of the strategy for food resiliency in Singapore. Uh, though at times we tend to forget um, the environmental impact that we are making as a consumption nation uh, to places like, like Malaysia in Cameron Highlands. If you look at the, this picture, it shows you uh, the degradation of land um, through the excess of demand for food in Singapore, right? In, in many times, you know, you have landslides, water table um, uh, incursions, uh, and these are not governed by Singapore law. Um, and, and we enjoy the cheap food from that. So there's the environmental price that we have to question uh, on the cheap food that we are enjoying in Singapore in general. Now, the opportunity presents itself in Singapore in a lot of sense, right? In political wise, 
in policy wise, Singapore has always been a garden city uh, and is positioned in the world as a city in nature today. Uh, so policies has been very strong, uh, whether it's the URA policy of landscape replacement area where it encourages developers to um, build green spaces within their, their development. Um, and so to, you know, um, and, and also green roofing. Today, we are probably aiming to close 200 hectares of green roof in Singapore. Now, all of these are probably primed for right to convert into food production zones. Uh, and this is the opportunities that we see for the future. But this policy is, is not um, uh, unique to Singapore. Globally, in many developed nations, you have seen food policy driven uh, around urban food production as one of the solutions, um, whether it's in Australia, in Seoul, in London, in Paris, they are all driving their own individual urban agricultural movement and putting a lot of uh, um, you know, uh, effort in that space. So I wanted to share with you some approaches to urban agriculture. Um, uh, of course, we, we, we are very unique in our environmental typography in, in, in Southeast Asia. Um, and if you leave any grass patch alone, it turns into a forest, you know, within a short period of time. Uh, how do we use these mechanisms to actually build uh, a more equitable food system? Uh, if you look at um, this picture, you know, you have um, big overstory food trees and palm trees that are, are producing oil uh, to protect the lower level food producing trees like coffee, uh, cacao and papaya that then uh, in in response, you know, also um, support the lower species of beans, corn, cassavas. It becomes a very, um, uh, what you call it, a food forest, a, a, a symbiotic relationship within nature itself. A lot of post um, millennium theories uh, have come into place, but a lot of it is um, actually stopped from uh, indigenous uh, practices and knowledge. Uh, this picture of alley cropping, for example, uh, is growing nitrogen, nitrogen fixing plants on the, on the boundaries uh, to naturally fix fertilizer into the soil uh, to support uh, the main cropping of corn and, and other food producing plants in the middle, um, thus creating a symbiotic relationship in its approach. We've seen in Singapore in the last, um, you know, uh, 20, 30 years uh, in, with the community gardening movement, uh, that these space, uh, a lot of community spaces have been converted into some form of food production. Uh, this is in Tampanese in the early days when we started. Uh, you can see the, the very soil-based open cultivation uh, methodologies that were employed. But today you see a lot more of um, um, ideas around vertical farming and controlled environment agriculture facilities, right? Um, so big agriculture investments into the space, um, has driven a whole different paradigm in, in um, what we see as factory farms for the future. So the, this movement has largely been driven, uh, again, from the Western world um, with rhetoric of the farm to table movement, a lot of times driven by a uh, foreign celebrity chef. Uh, you, you probably remember when Jamie Italian first started in Singapore, Jimmy Oliver being a champion of a local food system, uh, we, we managed to bring a community together to actually create their garden for them. Um, and, and, you, you, and we started to see that, that sort of growth in that space uh, in restaurants and FME establishment. At times, maybe as a marketing um, approach um, to, to maybe position themselves a little bit more sustainably, um, but their growth has been tremendous in the last um, five to 10 years. And, and what we were trying to address a lot of times is uh, the food that we grow to curb imports. A lot of these, um, for what we call finer produce, uh, like microgreens you see here on, on this slide, um, were imported from Holland in the past or Australia or the US. Uh, what, we, what we did was then to bring the model into Singapore, but to put a very social slant uh, towards it. And, and this actually gave um, the, the, the chefing industry and the hospitality industry, a new narrative around how they built their menus and narrative around that. 
but we went a bit deeper into exploring um, you know, our landscape in Singapore. This was a foraging expedition that we did with chefs uh, and, and just a, a short foraging expedition in Sentosa. Um, we, we, we managed to uncover so much diversity within our landscape. Um, and, and for them, they turned what was forage and locally farmed into a beautiful 10 course dinner that was uh, so intriguing. Uh, again, we, we hope to bring them back again to, to give more people that experience. But what is really important uh, while we have the sexy restaurant trade and then all of that is the community aspect. Um, of these urban farms, right? You start to see, um, you know, kids and adults coming to learn about uh, food, uh, how to grow food. Um, we started to see uh, intergeneration transfer of knowledge. Uh, this is Mr. Lin, you know, he, he used to be a farmer before, you know, his farm was taken away because of uh, resettlement. Um, and and he, he said, I want to die on a farm. And he came down, he started planting, he started to transfer his knowledge uh, of a grave knowledge uh, to the younger generation. And the, and the community movement started to grow, right? You, you, this, this was in 2013 when we started a uh, community garden in Sun Yat-san Center. But what we lack really as, as a people, as a nation, is the skills to actually um, do that, that, that farming. You can see here a team from SLA uh, learning the basics of farming, how to use a chanko, right? Uh, we need to relearn these skills and, and urban farms provide that platform um, to have that transfer of knowledge and also for the use. You know, it's, it's a very important um, sector that we work in uh, to, to really inspire the use uh, on food production and a lot of times build an environmental responsibility framework within themselves. I, I can quickly share a story. You know, we had this, uh, uh, this youth uh, join us for a lot of volunteering sessions. And, and when we were harvesting some vegetables, um, suddenly a vegetable dropped on the floor and she was really quick to pick up that vegetable and say, hey, we, we can't waste it. It's, it's a lot of hard work. You, you see from that simple sort of uh, gesture that uh, they start to form a, a sense of environmental ethics, right? Um, and and they, they, they feel that uh, it is hard work and we need to treasure that. And first, then that, that addresses the problem of food waste, right? So they, they tend to then waste food a lot less, which is a big problem for Singapore. And we, we work with uh, you know, um, children as well, right? To, to teach them on the process of food growing from composting, um, from the waste to regeneration of the soil to then growing their own food. Uh, a lot of times getting them dirty and you know, mucking in the soil as well. And one of the groups that, that's really dear to my heart is working with the elderly. Uh, and we have found through the projects that we have done, uh, this particular project in York Hill, um, where, where you have a lot of low income, uh, single elderly males, we brought them down, um, a lot of them socially isolated into a community garden setting. We call, them, we call it an Akong Farm project. Um, and and we, we saw a transformation in, in individuals within this short period of six weeks, right? Uh, you see the, the, the elderly gentleman in black, um, uh, Mr. Tan, when he first came down to the, to the project, uh, he was very quiet. He was looking down. He didn't say a word. You could see he was um, sort of mentally um, depressed, you know. By, by week six of the program, he couldn't stop talking. He was sharing. He was, you know, within community. So the power of community gardens and, and, and these farms go beyond uh, food production, but community bonding as well. And this movement is not simply in Singapore, right? You see um, globally happening in, in more established developed markets, but in the region, in Malaysia, for example, Kabun, Kabun, Bangsa, Ishu uh, Roots, you know, are all great examples of a social movement in this, uh, in this food ecosystem. Uh, Thailand as well, um, in the Philippines, and also in Indonesia. So, I wanted to bring this back into how we have thought about pivoting uh, uh, the approach of urban agriculture. 
over the last nine years, we have created social change using com community-centric agriculture, building many gardens and trying to impact as many people as we can. Um, but we feel that the approach was very fragmented, right? Um, because we were driving a movement. And, and what we wanted to do was to go beyond uh, that fragmented movement to focus really on system change, systemic change in the food system by pivoting it into something different. Um, and we found that actually the farms um, and, and, and working on the farm has actually therapeutic benefits for the elderly population. If you look at the, the demographic shifts and changes in Singapore, um, we are getting to a Japanese model, right, where you have a lot more aging population than young people. Social isolation is actually a big problem because a lot of illnesses actually come out from social isolation and depression. Uh, and, and using urban agriculture with, with a methodology and pathways of getting these elderly, pe elderly people into the farms with physical movement, mental engagement, social synergy, getting them to eat more healthily. Uh, we found that there is ability to actually reduce uh, stress markers within their body. The, these are all scientifically tested by NUS and MPARPS. And we have published a couple of journal articles on its ability to reduce stress markers within the body, specifically ILP6, which actually causes inflammation in the body. So things from depression, dementia, cancer, are all attributed to this stress marker. So the, the power of nature and engaging in something with nature uh, is actually um, really, really powerful. So I wanted to share uh, two videos. I, I hope I have a little bit of time uh, to show you the social impact that can be made from, from uh, urban farming. And this is Amit. He just went, he sat next to her. I... Every day want to go to work. Wherever the brother or sister is sick, right? So he was stay away, go and take a thermometer. I mean, okay. I mean, Beyond the sound, isn't that fantastic? Do you think you could talk us through the story, perhaps? Uh, beyond. Beyond, do you have the video by itself and not embedded in the PowerPoint? Seems like there is overall freezing on the side. I think Duan is frozen. Yeah. Yeah, I think so too. I think he might not be able to. Use, huh? so maybe you can WhatsApp him if you have this. Yep. So what we we'll do is uh, we will request for Bjorn to share that video and whoever wants, uh, we'll put it on our, perhaps on our website or Facebook yes. or put it on our YouTube, right? Yes. yes. I think it's uh, also anyway being recorded and uh, you just have to attach the video. Hi, Bjorn. Are you back? <laughs> You're frozen. Yes, I, don't think he's, I don't think he's frozen. He's uh, probably his speaker is turned on very loudly at, at, right. on his end. Yeah, correct. He's not frozen because he's moving his lips. He's even licking his lips. <laughs> okay, let me let me uh, text him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the problem when um, videos do take a lot of bandwidth on the computer. 
But even if we get the tape, we don't have the words either. So it doesn't help. No, we will get the we will get the whole video and put it on our YouTube. Or the original. Cool. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we all learn every week. So technology, uh, we need to know how to use it. And that's why we've got the uh, digital uh, people here. We got Colin Miles. <laughs> So um, any one of you, if you have any questions for Beyond later, can you please um, just uh, type it out in the chat group, but I'll also call upon you yeah, to uh, field your questions. Yeah, but um, yes, he's back yeah. now, I think. Hi, Hello. Beyond. <laughs> Beyond, hi. Sorry about uh, earlier on, uh, we actually couldn't quite hear the video, but uh, we were wondering if you could share with us, is this a link that is uh, available on YouTube, for example? Okay, I'll probably skip the other video. Uh, so mm. I just wanted to end, end the chat with, um, you know, this is quote from Masanobu Fukuoka, uh, which says the ultimate goal of farming is not the growing of crops, but the cultivation and perfection of human beings. I think that embodies what we do really in urban agriculture and what we hope to achieve uh, for the future as well. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Um, well, I, I always learn so much whenever I have a conversation with you. And, and, and yeah, so, so Bjorn and I, uh, you know, first knew each other last year when I invited him to be a speaker at the TEDx Duxton Hill countdown event. And, um, I mean, ever since then, you know, actually, um, what, what I realized is that, um, you know, what, what COVID has done was really spur, right, a, a whole new generation of urban home farmers uh, also. And um, yeah, so, so Bjorn, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, I mean, I, I'm so fascinated with, you know, the, the food ecosystem that you, you highlighted earlier, right? And I'm just wondering, what's your take on the current food ecosystem that we have in Singapore with, but I think because Singapore is so small, right, it has to be in relation to, you know, our neighbours in Asia, right? What do you think, um, what more do you think can be done, you know, on, on, a, on, on this level? That definitely is. Um, so sorry, I just read all the comments in the chat that you can't hear the video. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I'll do is uh, I'll send those videos uh, so that everyone can watch it at their own convenience side. We have a couple of videos where, where uh, the social impact is highlighted, um, whether the work with Rainbow School uh, Center and, and also with our autistic um, beneficiaries. Um, so, so of course, there, there, there's so much more we can do, right? Um, I think Singapore is still... Um, a, a very small um, market and ecosystem. Um, but whatever we do in Singapore um, can be um, positioned in a way that it can scale into um, you know, uh, our neighboring countries. Uh, for example, um, if we were to put a socially driven uh, urban farm in, in Indonesia, uh, perhaps you know, the, the idea is to start something in the slums to provide employment to the people in the slums, to teach them um, skills, uh, to provide employment, uh, and then to create also environmental impact uh, in the work that we do there. Uh, I think broadly the topics in, in the global food system has been shifting quite a bit. Uh, and a lot goes back to uh, indigenous practices uh, and native food um, um, frameworks, right? Um, in, in the recent United Nations Food Systems Summit dialogue that I, I participated in, uh, a lot of it were, were around building a more equitable food system globally. And this is about how do we empower uh, small holding farmers in the region uh, to really sustain themselves uh, through the food choices uh, or the food that they grow uh, and then providing pathways for them to um, gain a better livelihood uh, in that aspect. Uh, so a lot of work has been done globally. I think Sing for Singapore, it's a bit more challenging because uh, we do not have a lot of smallholding farmers to start with. Uh, and we, we rely on the global supply chain uh, for our food inputs, right? Um, but as consumers, you have the choice um, to, to, to demand food uh, from a more sustainable system from smallholder farmers 
if you start asking those questions, right, where is this from? How is it grown? Um, and, and in Singapore, we provide that platform, right, uh, through our citizen box scheme that you can subscribe to. Uh, you can come to the farm, you can talk to the farmers, you can understand how it's grown, um, and, and you can be part of that community. And that that is, um, uh, uh, surrounds food, right? You know, it's a community community thing is about sharing, it's about eating together, it's about enjoying harvest, it's about taking the risk when the harvest is not so good, right? It's, it's, it's sharing that risk with the farmer. And that's what we want to evoke uh, in Singaporeans to be more responsible consumers mm -hmm. that we can create broader change within the region um, through the food choices that we make. Thank you. Um, Suresh, I see that you have a question uh, that you've uh, put in the chat box. Would you like to just ask the question directly to Beyond? Thanks. Sorry, I have just unmuted myself. Hi, Beyond. Hi. Your, your knowledge about food sustainability and, and the environment and the social impact is amazing. I, I hope we can derive full benefit uh, working with you on this. So, so my question is, um, where do you think um, our club could, could make the most contribution in the work that you do? In, in other words, in a partnership arrangement with you? And as you know that the social impact uh, is or even more important than the environmental benefits for Rotary, um, you know, if you could enlighten us how best we could work with you? So, the, so that there's definitely many pathways uh, for, for that to happen. Uh, we will work with uh, many foundations on uh, various initiative. Um, and, and one of those is uh, to identify a potential beneficiary, right? So for example, we, we build a food garden for uh, the Migrant Workers Center. Um, and, and this was mainly targeted at, at risk uh, domestic foreign workers um, that were um, sort of uh, in the center um, waiting for arbitration or, you know, um, released back to their country. Uh, and the food garden that we built uh, with support from DBS Foundation was to um, get them to, you know, participate in, in, in some gardening for therapeutic benefits um, and also to produce some food um, that they find culturally relevant to them uh, so they can feel at ease uh, while they are going through a very tough time, right? That, that is one. Uh, we recently or um, currently are building a garden for ashram uh, in Singapore where it's a halfway house. Um, so uh, this will then provide some sort of uh, skills, uh, some learnings for um, the people that are based uh, in the ashram uh, to upscale themselves, to grow some food, to create some, some form of social enterprise, uh, selling the vegetables, uh, so these are things that uh, are lower hanging fruits, uh, if, uh, uh, forgive me for the pun, uh, that we could harvest uh, immediately. We, we still have quite a few beneficiary groups that are uh, in the pipeline that we hope to, um, to build gardens for and then to put programs for them. Um, I think in, in end day, you know, it, it, it can't always be just Edible Garden City uh, being there to guide them along the way. So what we tend to do is to put a train, the trainers program. We train the staff, we train the volunteers there um, to be able to carry out the program uh, down the line so that it's sustainable for the long term with the infrastructure already put in um, to, to enable that to happen. So these are some ways that we can uh, really sort of uh, make impact uh, in these organizations that are looking for uh, support in terms of funding to build these gardens and put in the programs in place. And, and this will then in, in turn uh, provide pathways for employment uh, when they do come out into society, uh, into the growing uh, urban agriculture or agriculture industry in Singapore. I have a follow-up question if I may. Um, do you think there are in there are the skill sets available in Singapore that you could then um, uh, kind of leverage on to train to train the uh, the beneficiaries to keep their own gardens? And is there enough of a support service in terms of agricultural material to sustain these gardens? Because 
in, embarking on this, I think is, is, is going to be very exciting and, and it'll only grow. So is there a support system for that? Um, so the ecosystem is still developing. It's still very young. Um, you know, today you cannot, you, you, you can't find a university that you can go to learn about agriculture, right? You can't get a, uh, a degree in agriculture science, right? That there's uh, no, but Republic Poly has uh, recently launched a urban farming uh, diploma or course. Uh, it's a part-time course where people can learn about techniques in urban agriculture, whether it's agri-tech. Uh, so the framework is starting to develop uh, into place. Um, what, we, what we train and what we teach um, uh, mainly are skills in regards to gardening, right? Um, so, so these gardening skills are translatable to agriculture uh, inputs, uh, agriculture uh, know-hows. Um, Material-wise and um, resource-wise, uh, I think agriculture is uh, a non-existent, almost non-existent uh, uh, industry in Singapore. So inputs have been very challenging from day one. Uh, we, but we were able to create uh, now an ecosystem uh, in a way that we are producing fertility from our farms through reducing food waste. Um, so through our black soldier fly farm, um, we turn um, uh, food waste into organic fertilizer that feeds back into our farming system. Uh, so slowly these infrastructure are coming up uh, and, and over time they will continue to grow. Uh, so I'm confident that, that there will be more of these coming up in the near future. Uh, so to create a robust ecosystem to support the industry for the future. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Suresh. Um, I'll call on to uh, PK, PK Walia for your question. I mean, now from, from what we can do on a club level, um, I, I think PK has some uh, questions on what we can do on an individual level. PK, are you on? Have you managed to unmute yourself? I think he just left. Oh, okay. So I'll just, I'll just, well, I'll just read out his question. He says, urban agriculture is so interesting. And as urbanization increases, can a family be self-sustaining through urban farming? So I think it's more really like, what can we as um, individuals, like, is our part really um, um, that, um, uh, yeah, what, what can we contribute as individuals? Sorry, I think he just oh, came so back. I think, yeah, I think he just came back. So <laughs> yeah. answering your question. Okay. So, yeah. uh, um, it, it is uh, unfortunately a, a utopian dream, dream uh, to be self-sustainable uh, in a household, right? I think the, the challenge that we face is because um, we, we all live in... Uh, quite confined spaces because we, we are quite land scarce. Uh, so a lot of people live in high rises, right? Um, so in terms of the available space to, to actually grow your own food can be quite limited, um, but you can produce uh, a substantial amount of green leafy vegetables um, uh, in a way that can add value to your, your daily diet. Uh, but, you know, people tend to set out on a, on a way to say, okay, I can cut my grocery bills by half if I grow my own food and things like that. Um, it, it, it is uh, not a good uh, impetus to start uh, because you'll find that actually the effort that goes in and the time that you're spending uh, can be a lot more uh, um, than, 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 than using your time to make money, right, in some ways. But if you think about the therapeutic benefits of gardening, uh, and that and how that adds to your mental health, that is intangible and that is so much more valuable. Um, in, in, in some uh, um, sort of scenarios, uh, they have worked out that it takes one acre of land, which is about 30,000 square feet, uh, to sustain a family uh, because you need a diversified system, right? You need to grow um, your own vegetables. You need to have chickens for eggs. You need to have one cow to produce fertility for your farm. Uh, you need to have a fruit orchard. You need to grow grains. Uh, so, so to consider all nutrition aspects, one acre of land for a household of four possibly work. And this book was actually wrote by John Seymour uh, in the 60s. Uh, you can find the book, uh, the handbook on self-sustainability where he actually charts down 
how to actually be self-sustainable as, as, as a smallholder or homestead farm. Um, a bit challenging for Singapore, but as a on a community level, if you look at the available space uh, in your community, uh, there's actually quite a lot of space that can be converted into community farms and community gardens. And these are the opportunity that could uh, perhaps uh, be uh, an additional layer of food resiliency for, for the country. Thank you. President, I just would like to check um, how much time uh, do we have? Um... Um, okay, so I think, I think we can go beyond a little bit today because we have a very interesting speaker as well as a very important topic. And now he's going to help us with uh, fighting the change in climate. We're seeing a lot of rain, a lot of floods here. So let's do our best. I think we can go on. For mm -hmm. members who really have something that you need to go off, uh, we thank you for coming. And I, 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 I'm sorry if I can't uh, bid you farewell. We will continue for a while. Thank you. Thank you. Bjorn, you are good to go on because we have a lot of questions for you. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, next, we have uh, Utam. Hi, Bjorn. Uh, one of the big problems that we have here is we are living in very crowded environments with uh, HDB and condos, etc. Now, a lot of these spaces, if you like, in between the HDB and the condos are often vacant and could be used for growing vegetables or edible foods generally. But I would think uh, government organization probably will turn around and say, no, don't do it because we might use it in the course of the next six months or one year or whatever it is. And um, I think we would be, would we be wasting our time uh, trying to cultivate something which will be uh, removed to build another HDB block or another condo, um, it can be quite frustrating. What are your comments on that's, that? That's a good point. Uh, we, a lot, of, a lot of our work is uh, really looking at underutilized space, right? I, I think the, the main challenge that when we started is that Singapore has no land. We have no land to, to do agriculture. Um, but when you walk, around uh, in Singapore, you see a lot of grass fields, uh, grass patches that's left empty, right? Uh, so, so the potential of these sites to be converted to, to farming or food growing or community gardens is, is prime for the, uh, uh, for the picking. Um, what we have done over the last nine years was to um, work with the government um, to really look at policies around this, right? The challenge with uh, state land, especially in HDB estates, um, is the, 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 the topic around commons, right? The common space. Um, if I was to start a commercial farm um, in the grass patch in HDB estate, um, someone in the community might say, hey, why are you doing that? I will, I will rather it be a grass patch. Um, and, and, and so that, that, that then sort of transgressed into political um, challenges, right, for, the, for uh, whoever that is managing the space. Um, and you have seen recently, uh, in the last few days, the uh, contention on the Bukit Batok uh, rooftop car park that was turned into a uh, quasi-community garden that was asked to vacate. Um, but it, it shows um, in a quick action of um, thinking that uh, the, the thinking in the government is changing that hey, you know, we, we shouldn't uh, immediately cut them off. Let's think of another solution. Today, Singapore has 1,300 community gardens under NPARC's Community in Boom project, right? The 1,300 community gardens are potentials uh, to convert into food producing spaces. Um, and, and that is something I know from, that, that they're, they're, being, they're working out on how, how do we do that in a safe way, right? Uh, because food safety is a big challenge, right? Um, if we have small producers in all these community gardens producing food, how do we ensure that the food that they're producing is safe? Um, so so that, that is still an ongoing exploration uh, from policy side. 
Um, but for a fact that um, government is generally supporting because there's a 30 by 30 agenda that we are trying to hit. Uh, so any effort in um, converting spaces into urban farms uh, is strongly considered at this point. Um, so, so again, it's then going through the correct um, chain of command to get the approval. Um, and, and once we get that, then we get we have the blessing to actually start something. One more question on that. Um, when you are talking of getting the chain of command into play, uh, what sort of time framework are you looking at? Uh, are we looking at a 10-year ten, ten framework when we have a whole lot of garden? We're looking at one year because today, if I wanted to look at creating an edible garden in a vacant plot near my condo, uh, I think I would run into a lot of problems. And it would discourage me and others to even think about this at this stage. For sure, yeah. Um, so so it it's, it's can be sometimes um, um, a lengthy process, right? Because um, if it's a HDB owned land, uh, you have to go to uh, the RC, uh, get an interest group growing, uh, and with the interest group, uh, then apply, I think, to RC and then to the town council, uh, and then the, the land will be freed up. If we are looking at uh, more private owned spaces, uh, commercial spaces uh, on top of rooftops of malls, for example, uh, you go through the, the um, URA route. Uh, where they would have to change the use of the space uh, into a urban farm for food production. But again, if you know we are a bit more creative with our approach, we can say that it's a community space uh, and because there's already a garden on top of those rooftops, we are converting those gardens into a food producing space that have community elements. Uh, and then it's easier to push through uh, without a change of use. So there are, there are ways around these. Uh, but generally, I think across board, uh, all the agencies are very supportive of this initiative. And there are, have been inter-ministry task force from the Ministry of National Development looking at urban agriculture as a strategy, um, a community gardening as a strategy for increasing food resiliency in Singapore. So the support is there. It's just that uh, we need to uh, really build the pathways to ensure success. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your question, Utam. And uh, yeah, we're calling on Alad. Thank you very much, Louisa, and uh, and good to meet you, Bjorn. Um, a couple of questions in regards to your uh, farming methodology. Are you using any uh, organic pesticides, or uh, is it, um, or, or do you use fertilizers instead of? And and secondly. Um, is it all uh, based on, on soil-based farming or are you using hydroponics as well? So we, we are agnostic to um, systems. Um, our, our main objective uh, using urban agriculture is to encourage community development and uh, social impact. Um, we have hydroponic farms, uh, vertical farms, and we also have soil-based regenerative farms. Uh, our approaches are very, um, in many sense, very natural in its approach. Um, um, for example, we use uh, organic uh, inputs and organic pesticides. Um, neem being one of the big ones that we use a lot of uh, as a basis of uh, dealing with pests. Um, so, so it's very natural in its approach, uh, except our sort of indoor farms and container farms, which are a little bit more technology driven hydroponic wise, uh, but they serve a different purpose uh, in, in its approach. So, so what we're trying to guard for is really a closed loop system. Um, if you look at Singapore's um, um, food waste issue, you know, every year we, we throw away 700,000 tons of food. If we are able to recapture that into a stream of converting that into fertilizer, uh, and then re-inputting that into our farming systems, uh, then we can close that waste loop cycle within the city itself. Uh, this is the ideal state that we, we hope to get to. Uh, we have a black soldier fly farm uh, on, on our facilities in Queenstown, 
so we produce uh, tons of organic fertilizer from there that goes back into our system uh, to grow food for the city. So we're dealing with a waste issue in the city so it doesn't go to Samakau uh, and then regenerating that to feed the, uh, the community and, and, and the population. So, so these approaches uh, obviously needs time to gestate uh, and then to scale. Uh, and then, you know, how do we go about that? But the principles of regenerative agriculture is something that we adhere to a lot of times. Yeah, because it's really important that we regenerate the soil uh, so that we have a more um, um, thriving ecosystem and biodiversity in, in, in Singapore. Right. Your, your community farm sounds like a, a, a great uh, way of um, addressing social impact. Um, but in, in terms of sort of commercial viability, uh, could you a little bit elaborate on supply chain and, and where the food is usually sold to if you commercialize it? Is it going into shops, supermarkets, restaurants? Um, I mean, we've seen uh, a, lot, a lot of restaurants focusing more on organic food and, and, and sustainable food in that map. Yeah, so, so the food system is, is uh, very complex, right? Globally, it's, it's a very complex system from uh, the value chain is very long, right? So from um, production to uh, supply chain management to then going into the distribution channels, um, and, and that complexity is uh, something that we, we're trying to address. Um, what we try to do is to go direct to customers a lot of times. Uh, so cutting away, um, you know, the, the middlemen like uh, the supermarkets and all, um, not, not in the sense that we, we want to increase the margins, but because we want to build a relationship with our customers. We want them to know the farmers. We want them to come to the farm to see what's happening to gain confidence in the system um, and, and that's really the, the intention. Um, currently, however, you know, um, because of the entire economics um, around the food system, uh, we are still struggling to produce uh, staple vegetables um, at a price that is competitive with imports. Uh, so at this point, it is a tough challenge uh, so we only service uh, restaurants uh, and the hotel trade for a lot of our uh, more high-end uh, produce that we grow, like microgreens and edible flowers. Um, but, you know, we, we are trying to normalize it. Um, while, once we scale, we are able to bring the price down. Uh, then we are able to, to provide staple type vegetables to the wider community because the, the, the end goal is really about a more equitable food system. And what we want to do is then, uh, of course, then, then the, the model will be on impact, right, in the community, less so on uh, returns or ROI uh, uh, in that. So we measure then the impact that we make in the community and food sustainability as our main uh, guiding principle, uh, rather than a normal business, uh, which is driven by ROI kind of return. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, Subash, I understand you have a question. Yeah. Have John, it's a, it's a very well uh, presented, it's a very complex subject. You have presented it very well. I think while you have been answering the questions, I had you have partly answered my question. Now, my question is a little different here. And we are talking about a solution. But if you look at what is the mother of the problem, Mother of the problem, which is probably huge wastage, you know, the 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 the, the, the amount of wastage in the developed world is more than fifty percent, and more the people are getting richer, more they are wasting. You know, now instead of producing more, of course that can go concurrently. The is there any ways? Is there any organizations who are working big way to reduce the wastage? Like we in Singapore. We have reduced the wastage of water big time. I think probably we are, because I was in the water industry, we maximum utilize the water utilization in Singapore is probably the highest in the world. Now, is there any ways the organization can help in reducing the wastage? You can elaborate that, and I would like to have your take on this subject. Yeah. I, yeah. 
the 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 problem is multi four right within the entire food system. Um, it's is um, a lot of it boils down to uh, distribution. Um, food is coming to uh, places where um, spending power um, is is uh, measurable to um, to command uh, food imports. Uh, it's not going to the people that needs food. Uh, therefore, the wastage is happening in. Um, you know, places like Singapore or cities um, where the potential spending power is a lot higher. Um, I think that that there is um, probably many ways to look at it and many ways to, to plug it. And, and, and it's looking back at the producing communities um, within the uh, region, right? Um, supporting smallholding farmers, uh, creating better livelihoods for them, creating direct access for them to consumers um, in these high spending uh, nations that demand uh, these food um, is, is what globally, um, um, you know, a lot of food foundations and organizations are working towards. Um, and, and for us, I guess in Singapore, as a consumption nation uh, is to um, then question and demand uh, food. Um, that is produced in a certain way uh, that elevates uh, the problem that we are facing. Um, we have found that actually through um, direct contact of producers and consumers, we are able to cut food waste through the logistic chain uh, by a significant amount because we plan and we grow specifically for the customers that have already subscribed to uh, our boxes. For example, we know what to plan, how to plan it. And so there's minimal wastage on the farm. There are still wastage, uh, don't get me wrong. There's still wastage, but we minim minimize that, right? Um, and, and, and that in a way by connecting these um, um, farms and farmers to end consumers, there's potential to further curb uh, loss uh, within that, that logistic and value chain uh, that, that is essentially the, the issue and the challenge that we're facing today. I think this is the is a subject by itself, you know. So I it think is. offline I'll I'll discuss with you because I Please. feel yeah. more we save, less we are to produce, which is not a rocket science, you know. Why we are to correct. produce when when we can cut the consumption and overfeeding and wastage of food. But but this this also goes to the easier the route. But this goes to then the global trade system that we have, right? Um, I give you an example of, of the UK, right? They produce 100% of their needs in potatoes, for example. Um, but for, for a fact, because they, they have to adhere to certain trade policies, they then export a certain amount to France, and then they have to import a certain amount of potatoes from another country. Um, and, and these are then trade policy in place that uh, enable global trade on in food to happen, um, yet though certain countries are sustainable in production in certain uh, food items. So, so we, we need to look at it from the trade perspective as well um, on, on these policies that are placed, um, are put in place, right? So, so, so it, it is a very complex issue and challenge uh, to fix. Uh, globally, everyone is looking at it um, but this year's theme for the United Nations Food Systems Summit is on uh, indigenous food practices and elevating that uh, to create better livelihoods for smallholding farmers. Uh, I think globally that will make an impact uh, in a way that, you know, uh, these people produce the food and ensure that their knowledge and produce is uh, reaching the market uh, in an equitable way so that they get the returns that they should get. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I think really at this point, I, I have to say that, you know, um, you know, to, you know, we, we, we have been also engaged because this is a topic that is so relatable to everyone. And um, 
I believe that you know this is just the start of a series of conversations that we can even um invite invite beyond back again you know to our Rotary Environment and Sustainability Group discussion, right? Where we can really further explore what are the you know what are the next steps because like personally for me I'll be looking at where I'm buying my vegetables. From now on, you know, not just reaching conveniently or, or reading the labels on the packets, right? And yeah, like if if I can be finding a a a, a farm, say in in um in Indonesia, you know, uh, I, I know there are some businesses out there, right, where you can actually place the order and a whole box gets shipped to you in in the homes, right? And um, that would really be supporting uh that ecosystem and and directly benefiting the farmers themselves. Right. And um, and I think locally we can already have some some ideas, perhaps, um, you know, that the, the we, there is a new Rotary Foundation Center coming up, you know, where they are serving the well, the young elderly, you know, but we can look at, yeah, you know, um, setting up a farm there or, you know, um, more ambitiously, perhaps even supporting a farm in Indonesia. Right. And then and then we all support it by by being clients. Of, of that. Um, actually, incidentally, we, we have a, a member, Irina, she's now back in New Zealand, um, but she actually started a social enterprise of women uh, growing um, root vegetables that can be turned into chips and then supplied to like a Batam hotel. And uh, yeah, we were also discussing a possibility of um, engaging some of our, our members um, you know, to, 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 to receive these chips and maybe turn it into a, a, a creative uh, recipe dish, right? And, 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 and share like a, a little contest, but it's really about how in small steps, small ways we can actually be supporting uh, these um, small farmers directly. Yeah. Um, we have um, um, two more uh, and then we will call it a night. Um, Mark, would you like to uh, come on and ask your question? Uh, you're muted, Mark. Would you like to unmute yourself? Or can someone unmute? Got it, got it. Sorry, I got too excited. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the talk and, and all the other questions. Um, so as the only person I believe in this group that went through an actual famine, I was in China 1959 to 61, where 35 million people died from hunger, from, from, from famine. And this apparently is equal to the entire population that died during the Second World War, eight years of Japanese invasion. But anyway, regardless, uh, so basically my point is uh, uh, famine and hunger is a bigger problem than the problem we all talk about all day, which is COVID-19. COVID-19, yeah, some people die and so on. We've got to, you know, so what, right? So this is a much bigger problem. So my question is, how can we draw the world's attention to this course about sustainability, about food, about avoiding famine and hunger? Thank you. Well, um, because COVID-19 has uh, exposed the fragility of the global food system, um, we, we have seen, um, uh, now, now I'm currently in Australia during uh, the lockdowns, uh, supermarket shelves are empty, um, supply chain stop. Actually, a lot of farms uh, that were producing uh, leafy greens and uh, milk uh, they, they started dumping stuff because logistic chains uh, were, were disrupted. Um, this just shows that it's, uh, it's really fragile uh, and any upheaval uh, could cause a disruption in that. Um, from, from the farm aspect, um, during, during COVID-19, we found difficulties of accessing seeds. Um, so we, we tend to buy our seeds um, from overseas. Uh, and and they, they, they didn't want to ship their seeds out. They, they kept it for mainly um, uh, their local consumption, right? So this is the US uh, in Europe. Um, and, and that was a challenge, right? So, so if we're not seed sustainable as well, that would be a challenge for the future. Um, and fertilizers as well. Um, if we are running hydroponic systems, for example, um, um, the imports of fertilizer were also curbed, right? So you know, they tend to come from Malaysia 
Uh, so we had an issue there as well. So it, it really requires us to think about the entire chain, uh, the closed loop cycle uh, of being a bit more resilient in those supply chain. Uh, I know from, from across the board and government, uh, they are looking at all these issues, especially on seed sustainability. Uh, thus, you, you, you see uh, Tomasic investing in uh, uh, Monsanto, which is a, a big seed company. Um, uh, to, to actually secure um, some of these uh, IPs around uh, seed propri proprietary information and knowledge. Um, um, whether I'm a supporter of that is, uh, is probably a debate for another day. Um, but I think generally, if we look back into, into World War II uh, in Singapore uh, and what sustained uh, the population then, we didn't have much rice. Uh, we didn't have much uh, nutrition um, and we got by with, um, you know, sweet potato, tapioca, uh, some of the more perennial type vegetables that grow very well in our climate. Um, perhaps uh, re-looking and learnings of uh, historical events uh, could help us plan a better and stronger resilient food system. Uh, we're working on this thing called the Landscape Nutrition Index. Um, in, in terms, in a way, we, we're trying to get um, developers in Singapore uh, to think about um, when they develop a building, instead of putting ornamental landscape, beautiful with bogan villas and whatnot, um, um, and measuring the amount of green space that they have converted, um, but to think from a nutrition standpoint, if I'm replacing a hundred bogan villa plants, with 100 tapioca, uh, tapioca plants, right? Uh, I am essentially storing uh, X amount of carbohydrates within my landscape. Uh, that will shift the needle because today we have 200 hectares of green roof in Singapore. Imagine that 200 hectares uh, growing uh, food um, that can be stored, you know, for the longer term because a lot of these plants are perennial plants. You know, they are not... Um, for, for example, leafy vegetables that you have to sow seed, harvest, you replant. These plants you put there, you manage them in a way they have a latent store of protein, carbohydrates, micronutrients. So we have to sort of think about it a little bit differently. And policy has to be in line with that to encourage that to happen because already we are spending a lot of money greening our city, um, but let's green it purposefully and for food security. And that may move the needle for us to hit the 30 by 30 um, in, in I, I think, uh, nine years time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And last very, but not least. Very, very good point, Bjorn. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, and last but not least, can we call upon P. James? He's got a, he's got a question on how, how do we make all this sustainable? Um, um, is he still... In yeah. The, um, hmm? Hi, hi Bjorn. I think that um, whatever you have uh, said today uh, actually would would be um, would have to be broken out into many, many, very many talks that will probably reach out to different groups of people. Um, that has various interests ranging from food sustainability to you know responsibly responsible farming to uh, you know hunger or or. All range, but I think maybe for our club, uh, more importantly is to how do we then translate it to uh, meet some of our social uh, causes that we are looking at. I think um, just looking at Singapore alone, I can see that some of your work uh, deals with uh, the, the elderly and special needs. Um, and um, I think maybe not at this moment, but more so we are quite interested to find out how are these projects uh, sustainable because um, that will be of great interest to us. I, I know it's quite easy to, to, let's do a farming project in one of the third world country. I, I have seen PP Jimmy did, um, you know, helping um, uh, uh, villagers in uh, Cambodia on uh, mushroom farming so that they can produce um, food for the restaurants that is in uh, CM Reap. Uh, those are easy projects, but locally in Singapore, uh, urban city, how do we then use, uh, you know, what you have shared um, to reach out to, I mean, to help the elderly as well as the special needs. And I think that that will be uh, the, something that we, our club will be quite interested to find out. That there, there, uh, again, there, there are multiple um, routes uh, to, um, to where this can, can happen. 
uh, I think maybe I can share a broader sort of initiatives that we are driving with um, NUHS. Um, and, and this is uh, looking at uh, the health aspect, um, which we call the health district. Um, we, we know for a fact that, um, you know, with the rapidly aging population, um, it's going to put a massive strain on the healthcare system um, when the time comes, right? Um, I think um, at, as the medical infrastructure that is in place in Singapore today um, may not be able to um, handle that incursion of uh, growth in, uh, in, in, in the elderly population. And so, so there are multiple um, solutions that they, they are looking at. And this is invoking a community approach to healthcare. Urban farming has been identified as one uh, stream of supporting that. Um, they have seen success uh, cases in Japan where they have um, in, involved elderly into the urban farming industry. Um, almost, you know, whether they are, they are there four hours a day to do some basic task uh, in, in, in agriculture, whether it's like sowing some seeds and then sitting down, drinking some coffee and tea, you know, chatting. Um, but it's the societal and community aspect that is more important because you are you're essentially bringing the elderly out from their homes uh, into a community setting um, and, and getting support from that community. Um, what we term as the productive longevity um, is if we are giving meaningful uh, encounters for these elderly uh, and for them to be productive in different ways, not, not in a work kind of, uh, even if they are volunteering on the farm, uh, there is a less propensity for them to fall sick. This is still a hypothesis uh, in many sense. Um, and, and we're working at NUHS to see um, how we can actually uh, institute that uh, within the Queenstown district, uh, because that's where our farm is located. And Queenstown actually presents uh, the best case for Singapore because uh, the population uh, demographics uh, is what Singapore will look like in 2030 because you have a broader elderly population. Um, if I quote uh, Professor John Wong, um, who used to be the ex-CEO of NUHS, uh, his hope is that um, in future, when an elderly person goes to a polyclinic uh, and say that you know he's suffering from uh, this ailment, he's a bit depressed and all that, uh, instead of prescribing him a, a, a course of antidepressant, uh, he prescribed him a course of urban farming at our farm, you know, to get him into the community and, and see what comes out from that. I think that itself encapsulates um, uh, the potential impact uh, that this can do into a healthcare industry. Uh, and, and this then is then translating how we bring uh, food production, uh, these urban farms to become care farms as well, uh, to provide care for the community uh, beyond food production. And, and then that has dual purpose and this will create longevity of urban farms for the future because we're not only dealing with one problem, but we're dealing with multiple social issues, um, whether it's providing employment to beneficiaries, uh, providing a safe space for elderly, providing a community space for intergeneration um, bonding with, within kids and children with the elderly. So, so it can go into that direction and that's what we're building towards. Um, but, yeah. you know, it's a long journey, you know, we, we're just at the quite, quite the start, you know, we're still running studies with uh, NUS and, and, and parks, um, and, and they have done studies on dementia patients, pre-dementia patients, uh, going through a series of horticulture therapy programs and measuring the outcomes within those. Uh, but it is a very powerful tool and there's, there's really strong scientific evidence that uh, it's, it has a propensity to reduce stress markers within uh, the, the intervention group. Uh, so we, we're still working towards that. Um, yeah. But this is something where I see can, can make impact for Singapore. Yeah, I can I can imagine um, the um, the partnership that we could potentially have um, to pilot some of some of the projects as well as to to think through how um, uh, the club can actually contribute to the larger um, you know community where we can see that Singapore is obviously being uh, going to um, 
uh, as an aging nation, um, this is some this is an area that probably would address a lot of uh, health issues uh, as he as he goes uh, goes on. And I can tell you that you don't need research. You you know, being a person who turned fifty to this year, and I can tell you the plants uh, has a great impact on keeping keeping me sane in this COVID season. <laughs> so um, yeah, so. So having said that, there are also many other partnerships that we can think about, like, you know, reaching out to the youth and teaching them about um, um, about some of the um, concepts about food waste stages and, you know, how they can be part of the larger um, uh, movement for the environment. So um, we will engage you probably at another platform. I think that many of the directors uh, will also have uh, ideas, you know, like even, you know, where we, we work with uh, many businesses where you can advocate for, you know, having um, uh, farming at their offices instead of, you know, beautiful Brogan Villas, as you have mentioned. So so let's let's um, bring this to a wrap. And and we want to actually thank you for every... Oh, sorry, I'm not supposed to be giving the word. Oh, please go ahead and do the word yeah. of thanks, James. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, myself finish it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you're doing a good job. No, I think that because you have mentioned so many areas and it, it probably even involved um, the projects that we could potentially work with our overseas partners Partners, and many of them are actually in, you know, uh, amongst us, uh, you know, in Kuching, uh, Pauline, we could actually do a project with you, you know, uh, with uh, farming at some of the rural areas. So, so there are many, many uh, potentials in what what uh, what you have mentioned, uh, and, I, and I thank you for sharing uh, all this with our club, and I think that you have given us plenty to think about and plenty that um, to to collaborate uh, if uh, if possible where the, where the constellation comes uh, falls in place where we can uh, uh, maybe you know start some small projects and see how it goes from there and I thank Louisa for finding you you know and having you to speak to us today and I think that you have really uh, added to our uh, uh, knowledge uh, in many many ways uh, in, indeed you really really in an expert in this area and and definitely the guru that we can turn to you know if we are looking uh, to do any project we um, in uh, in this area so once again on behalf of the club we would like to thank you uh, uh, and you know and definitely we have gained a lot so i think it leaves us to give you a round of applause for for you know for uh, for sharing everything uh, with us today thank you very yes, much let's all okay. unmute uh, ourselves and give uh, beyond a round of applause Thank you, thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, say that, you know, you look, uh, I'm 10 years younger than you, but thank you look younger than me, so I think you're doing a good job, man. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Bjorn. Thank you, everyone. All right, okay. thank you so much. Yeah. So good I will night. now uh, share screen for the last remaining part of this evening. So we will type once again to thank Bjorn and Louisa. And of course, uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to ask Louisa, who is more than happy to share more with you. And whatever videos we had just now that we couldn't really play, we will do that in our YouTube or our website here. Yeah? Okay, so now let's talk about next week. You know, every time we have one speaker talk about technology, then the next one will be about the environment. And next week, we are back to technology. <laughs> so this is an important aspect as well. Okay, so next week we'll have Dr. He Rui Min. Okay, grab developer. So he's the one that uh, make you use more of the delivery, uh, transport. And uh, we will really learn a lot from him next week. And uh, we will have another round of uh, important questions. I'm suppose, I suppose you will do your own research. Ask Mr. Google and then come with your questions next week, all right? For those who are out of Singapore, Grab may not have reached you, but certainly this uh, homegrown company will grab you one day, right? <laughs> okay, and that leaves me now to say a big thank you for all of you. This evening, we had a number of, uh, a record number of attendees. Uh, we had about almost 80. So really thankful for all the support and participation Good to see all the Rotarians who had not been seen for a while coming back. Really appreciate your coming here. So thank you thank and you good President. night. Thank you very uh, much. We will not end here. We will just have uh, five minutes or a few minutes of fellowship after this. Okay. Thank you. So we'll call a close to the meeting and uh, let me ring the bell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah.